Hello everyone. Uh, I'm Ananta. I'm a PhD student here working in uh, Logic. So in the afternoon talk, we have uh, Vijay. He is a assistant professor in CMI. And uh, he'll be talking about uh, how to depict our spherical globe on a flat map. Is it better like this? Better like this. Okay. So um, thanks for the introduction. It's uh, I'm very happy to be here to talk today. Um, so I wonder if you've seen this map before. Maybe we can dim the light a little bit. So I'm guessing a lot of you have seen this, but how many people have seen this map or something very similar to it before? Just raise your hand if you've seen this map. It's the standard map that's used in Google Maps. It's called the Mercator projection. If you haven't seen this, you may have seen um, this map. It's the standard map used in most schools in India. It's very, very similar to the Mercator projection. It's just a slightly skewed version of it. So hopefully everyone has seen this map or this map here. They're, they're the maps that we use maybe 90% of the time that we're, that we're using maps. Um, okay, for now, I'll just leave this here. So even if you haven't heard the term Mercator projection, you, you would have used this map to get around when you're traveling. And maybe you've heard of the fact that this map is not perfect, that there's problems with it. Um, does anybody know any problems with the Mercator projection with this map? Can anyone think of anything? Maybe they've heard of it before, or maybe they actually see something that looks a little funny on the map. Though that might be difficult if you're just used to seeing this map and only this map. So does anybody have a guess about some property of this map that's not quite perfect, that's not representing reality the way we would expect it to? The size of? What do you mean by size? You mean, do you mean the area? Yeah. So the area of places near the poles, and what about that area? They're slightly exaggerated. Yeah, exactly. So um, any other, are there any other strange things about this map? So one, that's a really good um, point. The area is skewed, especially if you go far north or for, far south, towards the North Pole or the South Pole. Besides the area, is there anything else that this map does not quite get right. Any guess? Sorry? Orientation, orientation of the Earth. Uh, what do you mean by orientation of the Earth? <laughs> orientation of the places. OK. So do you mean but orientation in terms of what? Do you mean like north, south, east, west? Or do you? Sorry? Ah, uh, OK. So OK, we'll, we'll come back to that later. But that's, that's it, the map does get north, south, east, and west correct. But there may be more to orientation than that. So are there any other guesses about things that this map doesn't get perfectly right? That's right. So uh, that's, again, the area. And that's a good example of the problem with the area, which is that Russia looks really, really big. And in fact, we're going to see it later, but Russia is actually significantly smaller than Africa. But in this map, you, you wouldn't know that looking at this map. In fact, you could fit Russia, Mongolia, and China all in Africa. So that's, again, going back to this, the area problem. But, but it's good to emphasize that. But there is one other thing that I wanted to, that, that this map is misleading about. So what if you wanted to go from, say, Chennai to Iceland? How would you, and you wanted to go, and you wanted to fly there, of course, you're, you're taking an airplane, but you wanted to conserve fuel and go in an efficient manner. How would you want to go from Chennai to Iceland? What's the shortest path between two points? 
a straight line, right? So you would think you can just take a straight line path from Chennai all the way up to Iceland. Does it, how many people think that would be the shortest path from Chennai to Iceland? Okay, people are, are skeptical of that. Okay, so we'll come back to that again, but that's another thing that the Mercator doesn't get, um, do very well, which is show us shortest paths between points. So given all these problems, why do we use the Mercator? Does anyone know of a better map, or is there a better map out there? Any, any guesses? Does any, has anybody seen another map, or does anyone know a reason why we use this map? Hmm? I mean, these seem like pretty significant problems with the map. All of Russia and China fit into Africa, but it doesn't look that way. And it's like pretty hard to figure out how you'd want to plot an efficient course from one point to another. So given these problems, why do we even use the Mercator? So this because the Earth is actually round, spherical, so we are uh, having a 3D object onto a 2D plane. So we are projecting it, so that's why we, need, we are using it. Because our screens are two-dimensional, we need... Uh, something 2D to project on. Right, right. So that's, that's a really good point. There's something, something has to do with, the, with um, the fact that we're going from a round sphere to a flat map. Something is, a lot of things are getting skewed that way. So, um, and in fact, the reason we use, that we often use this is that although there are maps that are better for certain things and better for other things, there's no map that is perfect. So, Maybe you've noticed that when you, if, you've, if you've peeled an orange, the pieces of the orange will still have some curvature to them, some, some curviness. And you can kind of try and squish them down, but if you do that, they'll actually break apart. So you can't really flatten an orange without tearing it or really stretching it and distorting it in some way. So the mathematical fact behind this is very similar to what you just said, which is that even a small portion of the sphere, forget the whole sphere, even a small portion of it, there is no way to project or give a um, flat image of even the smallest portion. You're going to cause a lot of distortions when you do that. And the reason is curvature. The sphere and the plane have different curvatures. So I want to spend a little bit of time discussing what I mean by curvature, what, what this concept of curvature actually is. So an intuitive idea oops, of curvature is that it kind of measure on, on the plane, we're used to doing geometry on the plane. And when you draw a circle on the plane with radius one, what would you expect the circumference of that circle to be? So a, a circle of radius one, the unit circle, what is the circumference of that? <laughs> Two pi, that's what we're used to seeing in the plane. And in some sense, one, one aspect of curvature is that if you have a, a surface that has positive curvature in some region, if you were to draw a small circle in that region, your circumference would always be, um, well, it, the, the ratio of the circumference to the diameter would always be less than 2 pi. You'd always be having not quite enough angle to make it flat. So you're missing angle in some sense. And on the other hand, if you have a saddle which has negative curvature, and you draw a small circle in some region that's, that has negative curvature everywhere, the opposite problem is going to happen. You're going to have too much angle, and the ratio of the circumference to the diameter is going to be greater than 2 pi. So intuitively, curvature is telling us something of that, how much angle we're packing in around different points. Another aspect of curvature, another thing we can see if, um, when we look at surfaces of constant curvature, has to do with the angles, angle sum in a triangle. So in a flat plane, every triangle has the same angle sum. And what is that angle sum? 180 degrees. But in a positive curvature uh, surface, like the sphere, looking at the picture, what would you think the angle sum would be? Greater than or less than or equal to 2 pi? Greater than. You can see that somehow the lines are moving apart. And on the other hand, in the saddle, in the negative curvature surface, the opposite happens. The lines get squished together, and the angle sum looks like it should be less than 180 degrees. So that's another kind of intuitive way to think about curvature. But let's give a more precise definition. So I'm going to define something called Gaussian curvature, which applies to surfaces. 
So mathematicians and physicists, they also deal with curvature of higher dimensional objects. In fact, tomorrow morning, you're going to hear about that in a talk by a physicist. And um, he's going to use a few ideas that we're going to talk about today in this talk. But today, we're only going to be talking about curvature of surfaces. So Gaussian curvature is a specific type of curvature we can, we can calculate when we have a surface. Now, to define Gaussian curvature, I first want to define something called the radius of curvature of a plane curve. So imagine that you have a, we're just in the plane now, and we have some curve. At any point of that curve, we can always draw a circle that approximates the curve. Some, the technical term for this is an osculating circle, which means a kissing circle, because the circle looks like it's just nicely, snugly, well, kissing is maybe not the best verb, but it's kissing the curve. So the radius of curvature of um, the plane curve at that point P is the radius of that circle that best approximates the curve at P. And the curvature of the curve at P is 1 over that radius of curvature. So now let's move to a surface. And at a given point P on a surface, we can intersect that surface with, all, with many, many different normal planes. And each plane, each cross section, will have a plane, will, will consist of a plane curve. So each normal plane that intersects the surface, that intersection is going to be a plane curve. So for each of those plane curves, we can measure the, the curvature, or the radius of curvature of it. Um, now, although there's infinitely many of those, we can look at the maximum and the minimum radius of curvature. And I want to also put signs, pluses and minuses, to my radii of curvature. So I'll put a plus if the circle center is above this, the surface, and I'll put a minus if it's below the surface. So, that, so in this way, I can calculate a maximum and a minimum, extremes of curvature at a point P, when I look at all the different normal surfaces that intersect it. So taking rho 1 to be the maximum and rho 2 to be the minimum signed radii of curvature, we define the Gaussian curvature to be 1 over rho 1 times rho 2. So somehow it's capturing the most extreme radii of curvature we can get, the most extreme curvatures we can get at a given point. Remember, the curvature of the curve is 1 over the radius of curvature. So this is really the product of the most extreme two curvatures we can get at that point. So yes? No. I mean maximum and minimum without the modulo. So we have signed curvatures, so they're any, all different real values, some are pl plus, some are minus. And we take the maximum and the minimum without any, without any absolute value. No, this, in this definition, we're looking at surfaces in R3. So the following surfaces are the standard examples of um, well, they're, they're actually the only examples of surfaces that have, well, that's not true. <laughs> there's actually another one. But these are examples of surfaces that have constant Gaussian curvature. So can you determine the Gaussian curvature of the unit sphere using the definition we just gave? So it has constant curvature, I'm telling you, so it doesn't matter which point we look at. So at, take any point. Can you determine the Gaussian curvature of it? Well, we'll want to look at all the different normal curves that intersect the sphere at that north pole, for example. When we do that, what are the extreme, what, what are some of the radii of curvature we can get? Does anybody have a, a guess, or does anybody know what we would get? What is a normal, what is the, what is a normal um, cross section of the unit sphere at the north pole look like? Yeah, I, a few, uh, quite a few people seem to get it. It's just going to be a unit circle. And it's already a circle, so the circle that best approximates it is itself. And that if it's the unit sphere, that's going to be a unit circle, and it's going to have radius uh, 1. So no matter which normal surface we take, we're always going to get 1 as our cross-sectional curvature. And therefore, the Gaussian curvature is also going to be 1 because there's no ex the extremes are also just going to be one. Um, what about the cylinder? 
So take a cylinder with radius 1 and height h. Uh, or let's, let's actually make it in. Let, let, let's, let's look at the curvature somewhere that's not on the boundary of the cylinder. So take some point sitting in the middle of the cylinder. What would the Gaussian curvature be? Remember, we're looking at normal planes. So you're looking at planes that are parallel to the xy plane that intersect this point here. Um, or sorry, sorry, I take that back. Any, any plane that is perpendicular to, OK, let's take a specific point like this point here. So a normal plane will be any plane that contains the y-axis. So um, at, when we intersect with planes like that, what are the extremes of curvature we can get? So one extreme will be that we intersect with a plane which is parallel to the xy plane. Then we're going to get the, that planar curvature to be 1. The other extreme, though, is if we take a plane that's parallel to the yz plane. Then the curvature is just going to be 0 because So for, for th that extreme, it's just a straight line. And maybe I should have just defined it that way, but a straight line has curvature 0. So in some sense, the circle that approximates a straight line would be infinitely large. So the curvature would be 1 over infinity. So we end up having 0 times 1 as our Gaussian curvature, which is 0. So the cylinder will have curvature 0 everywhere. Um, so the reason that I wanted to bring up curvature and the reason it has to do with our discussion about maps is that, the, is that there's a special theorem of Gauss that is called the theorem of egregium. It's going to come up again tomorrow. But one, of the, one formulation of it is that any distance-preserving map from a surface S sitting in R3 to a surface R sitting in R3 must preserve Gaussian curvature. So in other words, if you, one, one aspect of that, if you take a surface and sort of bend it without stretching it, so you're preserving distance, you're also preserving the Gaussian curvature. So maybe you've seen this in school. One practical aspect of that is that if you have a pizza that you're trying to eat, the pizza is flat to begin with. So the curvature is 0 everywhere. When you pick it up to try and eat it, if you're not careful, it can flop down, and then it's very difficult to eat. But because by the theorem of Regium, the curvature has to be 0, 0 curvature has to be maintained, if you curl the pizza a little bit in this direction, this lateral, lateral direction, it can't possibly curve downwards. Because if it did that, the curvature would become negative 1. So that's one consequence of the theorem of Egregium. We're going to see a more significant one later. And tomorrow, you'll see an even more significant consequence. So, um, so what, have, what have we seen? So OK, the sphere and the plane have different Gaussian curvatures at every single point. They're, they both have constant curvature. Here, it's 0 everywhere. Here, it's 1 everywhere. So what that tells us, what the theorema egregium tells us, is that any map from the sphere to the plane, any map from any part of the sphere to the plane, must distort distance everywhere because the Gaussian curvature is different everywhere. So, so the situation looks really bad for maps of the Earth. We can never get distance correctly. And um, we can't even get distance correctly in some small portion of the map. I mean, literally, what this says is that anywhere you go on the map, take any minute neighborhood of any point, the distance is going to be skewed. You can't capture it properly anywhere. So. It might come as a surprise that we can preserve certain properties of maps uh, of the sphere in maps. One of these properties is which is the curves of shortest distance, which are known as geodesics. So um, let's quickly define or review what we mean by a geodesic or a curve of shortest path. So what is a curve, what is a path, a shortest path between two points in the plane look like when you, if you have two, it's a straight line. And what about the sphere? If we're looking at the sphere S2, like the Earth, what does a shortest path look like between two arbitrary points on the sphere? 
It'll be some kind of arc, and it'll be which type of arc? Right, so you need, but I think, I don't know if you said this. So it's important that that plane goes through the center of the sphere. Otherwise, it won't be a shortest path, a curve of shortest path, of shortest distance. Um, so the one term for that is a great circle. So if we want to connect, say, this point and this point, there's going to be many planes that intersect the sphere and give us, so for example, suppose we have a point here and a point here. There's various planes we could cut the sphere with between, that, that would hit both of those points. And that would give us various curves between them. But only one is actually minimizing distance. And that's the one that goes through the center of the sphere. It's a great circle. So a great circle is any circle that divides the sphere into two equal parts. So these are the curves of shortest distance on the sphere. And given any two points on the sphere, you can always find a great circle between them. Uh, that's a good question. So, I'll, I'll, so can anybody tell, tell me, what about um, going back to the map, we have lines of latitude and lines of longitude. Are lines of latitude geodesics? Only the equator. That's the only one. What about lines of longitude? Every single one. Every single one, exactly. And in fact, though, okay, in the standard Mercator projection, those are the only geodesics, the equator and the lines of um, longitude, which are ac actually represented as straight lines, as geodesics in the plane. All the other great circles are going to look very strange under the Mercator projection. So. Going back to Google Maps, suppose we wanted to fly from Chennai to Chicago. The shortest path would actually look like that. It would go up, almost up to the North Pole. It would go pretty far north. Um, in fact, you can, in Google Maps, they, you can measure distance between points. So you can actually play with this yourself and see what the shortest path looks like between any two points on Earth. And, and sometimes it's quite counterintuitive. OK, so clearly the Mercator doesn't preserve geodesics, except for a few special geodesics, the equator and all the lines of longitude. But there is, surprisingly, a map that does preserve geodesics. And this is known as the gnomonic projection. It's the oldest projection we know of. I think it's from the 5th century BC or something. Um, that's the first record of it. There's one problem with it, which is that it only projects a single hemisphere of the map, of the sphere and it projects it onto the whole plane R2. So it's not that useful necessarily unless we're dealing with a very small portion of the Earth that we're interested in. So the way it works is, in this case, I'm taking the southern hemisphere. You take the point at the center of the sphere, and you project through, by straight lines, you project all the points on the lower hemisphere outward onto the plane R2. And Maybe you can convince yourself that in this process, you're going to map this open southern hemisphere, not including the equator, onto the entire plane R2. You'll cover every point in the plane. Because as you get closer and closer to the equator, you go closer and closer out, further and further out to infinity. So you'd end up covering the whole plane through these projections, by projecting these points. And this map, it's going to take every point of the southern hemisphere to a distinct point of the plane. So, Here's what this would look like if we did it from the North Pole. And again, it's just a portion of it, because the full projection would be all of R2, which we can't fit into a slide. So this is just a small portion of the mnemonic projection near the North Pole. And as you can see, it skews all kinds of other things. So it's not the nicest projection, except it does get geodesics right. So can, it, can anybody here prove, maybe you can think for a few, for half a minute, that the gnomonic projection actually takes geodesics on the sphere to geodesics in the plane. Why, why is it that I'm claiming that the gnomonic projection takes geodesics to geodesics? Does anyone have an explanation? Imagine a ray of light from Let's go back to here. Say that again? Imagine a ray of light from 
Yeah. And if we solve the geodesic, we will get geodesic unit. Yes. So a geodesic, remember, is just the intersection of a plane that goes through the origin with the sphere. And any plane that goes through the origin is going to then take, and, it, and that line is going to go to the intersection of that same plane with R2. And the intersection of a plane with R2 is a line. The intersection of, a, of that plane with the sphere is a great circle. So that great circle is going to go precisely to that line. So you can think about it a little bit more uh, if you're not convinced. But, but basically, that's the reason. And unfortunately, we can't do this with the full sphere. And in general, the mnemonic projection is not very useful for most applications. Most maps we commonly use will, as a result, fail to capture geodesics. So that's one of the properties that we just have to learn to live without, kind of like distance, which we literally can't capture properly. Um, on the other hand, another property that, is, that we talked about earlier is surface area, or area of small regions. So it is possible to make a projection that preserves area perfectly. Um, the Mercator we saw already fails badly at this. And we can see that, for example, when we move uh, countries on the Mercator down to different parts of the projection. So this, in this example, the person who made this program has moved Greenland down into Africa. And we can see the true size of Greenland and see that it's actually much, much smaller than Africa. Um, in fact, the Mercator projection is so off that although you would never expect it looking at the map, all of these countries fit nicely into Africa. United States, China, India, most of Europe, almost all of Europe. Um, alternatively, you can fit Russia, Mongolia, and China all into Africa. So the size of Africa is way off. Um, I guess I can take a second to actually show this program. Um, So, so this program literally let, just lets you select countries and move them around to different parts of, of the Mercator projection. Um, and you can find it if you just Google the true size of. So does anybody have a country that they want to see the true size of? Name your favorite country, anybody. Sorry? Australia. So. So you can take Australia. And Australia is actually not so far from the equator. So it only shrinks a little bit when we move it up, for example, into Africa. But if we were to move it all the way up into Greenland's territory, we see that it becomes absolutely enormous. Uh, similarly, you can see how drastically Russia shrinks as we move it down towards the equator, which is why we're able to actually fit it inside of Africa. So, OK, maybe we have time for one more country. Anybody else have a country that they think is feeling neglected? Spain. Spain. OK, so Spain over here is, again, it's not too terribly skewed, but it is a bit larger than it should be. In fact, all of Europe is actually quite a bit smaller than it should be. Um, if. Um, Yeah, I guess we'll, we'll come to that. We'll, we'll, OK, let's actually try and see. So this lets us see how badly the Mercator does. But maybe we can try and see a map that does a better job, and that might give us an even better overall sense of what areas of, of countries really should look like. So as I said, there is a, country, a map preserves area perfectly. And the most elegant example is the cylindrical projection. Um, the way the cylindrical projection works is you take the sphere, S2, you subtract the north pole and the south pole, and you take a cylinder with the same height and the same radius. So that cylinder is just going around the sphere. And you project points out onto the cylinder and then unwrap the cylinder. And the way this projection works, it's no longer projecting from the center of the sphere. Instead, we fix z values of points. We fix heights of points. So in every 
horizontal cross section, we project outwards from the central axis of the sphere. So in the sphere, we just, in every, in every horizontal cross section, we project out into the cylinder. And as a result, at the end, we get a cylinder with the same height as the sphere. So that's fine. You can kind of imagine how this projection works. But for me, it was completely surprising and counterintuitive that this would be an area-preserving map, especially given the fact that we know distance, it's impossible to preserve distance. So it's already strange that there can exist an area-preserving map. And why would this map be area-preserving? Yeah, so that tells you something about the, OK, that, that tells you that in a certain direction, it should be length preserving, that lateral direction. But the more surprising part is that in the orthogonal direction, it's area preserving. Um, so, what, yeah, so when we unwrap the cylinder, we'll get a map that looks like this. So this is a, an, an area accurate map of the planet. Um, the proportional areas of all the different countries are perfectly on the nose. And you can see that Europe is just tiny compared to what, how we're used to seeing it. And Africa is actually much bigger than we're used to seeing it. Um, so this theorem that this cylindrical projection preserves area everywhere um, is actually due to Archimedes. And I'm going to go through a quick sketch of the proof of it. So the basic idea is that if you consider a sphere of radius r enclosed by a cylinder of radius r and the same height as the sphere, 2r, the, um, we, can, we can show that any horizontal slice of the sphere will have the same surface area as the corresponding horizontal slice of the cylinder. This is true for, we'll show that this is true for infinitesimally small slices of width dz, but actually this is, as a result, it's actually true for any slice of any width. So that's quite surprising for a few reasons. I mean, maybe, you, maybe you've known this already, but it's not something that you, it's not a fact you use every day that if you take a sphere and look at any, say that you have a sphere that has radius one foot. If you take any one inch uh, horizontal cross section of that sphere, it doesn't matter where you take it, the lateral surface area is the same. For all of those different slices you take, they'll all have the same lateral surface area as one another which is in fact the same as the lateral surface area of a cylinder of height one inch and radius r. So, so that's really the result that Archimedes was proved and was very proud of. Um, so we'll prove this just for an infinitesimally small uh, horizontal cross section. Um, so the key fact is that this cross, this cross section with width dz has surface area equal to two pi r dz which is also the area of the corresponding slice of the cylinder. To see this, know that the width of that strip is r d phi, where phi is this angle here. And for small dz, we can approximate the surface area of this strip as a frustrum of a cone, specifically a cone with radius r sine theta, or sorry, r sine phi, and slant height r d phi. So that first term, if you remember from your high school math, has area pi times 2r sine phi times the slant height d r d phi. But this quantity is actually just 2 pi r dz, since dz, z is actually, we're, being, we're measuring it from the top down. So z is actually equal to r minus r cosine phi. When we differentiate that, we get r sine phi d phi. So uh, you can. Um, think more about this proof later, but that's, that's a very quick overview of why this is true. Um, Archimedes was so proud of the discovery that he actually had it engraved on his tombstone. It was, in his mind, his crowning achievement in life. So, um, so it's, in fact, he also proved not only that the surface areas are the same, but that the volumes are the same. So uh, that was, that, 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 that's, but, but all of that together was his major um, point of pride. 
So before we move on from the cylindrical projection, there's one last thing I wanted to show, which is that we can actually see that it preserves area by using uh, something called Tissot's indicatrix, which is just a fancy word for taking the sphere, taking a bunch of small disks that are evenly spaced around the sphere, and looking at where they go to on the map. So this is a way that cartographers determine how good a map is. So you can see that, OK, it's a little hard to see, but you can believe that these are the same area. But we can also see that it distorts shape quite badly. So although this map is better than the Mercator projection in terms of area, it looks like it might be worse in terms of shape. So the final property I want to talk about is exactly shape and what we mean by shape mathematically. So the way that we determine whether a map preserves shape is to look at what it does to angles. And we say that a map is conformal, that's the technical term, if it preserves angles everywhere. And as a result, it'll preserve the basic shape of objects with some amount of stretching permitted. But um, so a few examples. The map from R2 to R2 that sends UV to lambda U, lambda V, is an example of a conformal map. On the other hand, the map that sends UV to lambda U, comma V, is not conformal. Can anyone tell me why the second map is not conformal? How does, how, can, can anyone tell, show me why the second map does not preserve angles everywhere? Is there an angle that changes when we apply this map to it? By an angle, I mean, if you want, you could think about two lines that intersect at a certain angle, see where they go under the map. Do they still have the same angle between them? So can you think of a counterexample where in the second map, we have two lines that have a certain angle of intersection between them, but after pushing them through this map, that angle has changed. If you can find. Um, that's true, and that is, um, but we haven't shown that that is exactly what we want. Can we, can we literally show that there's an angle that changes? I mean, what you're saying is true, and that does show that it's not conformal. But using this definition, that it preserves angles everywhere, can we find an even more specific angle that actually changes? Tangent? Uh, okay, but okay, so maybe I'll, I think some people might have the answer, but I can. Um, what under the second map here, I haven't said what lambda is, by the way, so that's my bad. Let's say that lambda is, because obviously in the second map, if lambda is the number one, then this will be a conformal map because it'll be the identity. But let's say that lambda is the number two. So what would happen under the second map to the angle between the x-axis and the y-axis? Or maybe that's not the best example. What about, what would happen, where would the vector 1, 1 go under the second map? The, under the second map, what, if, if lambda is equal to 2, where would the vector 1, 1 go? 2, 2, 1, exactly. And where would the vector um, 1, 0 go? To 2, 0. So if you imagine the angle between the vector 1, 1 and the vector 1, 0, that angle is 45 degrees, right? On the other hand, what's the angle between the vector 2, 1 and the vector 2, 0. OK, well, anyway, it's more, it's, uh, it's less than 45 degrees. So you can see that it's changed. So, in that, so that, that's, that's where this map, this is one way that this map fails to be conformal. Um, so you can give a more technical definition involving tangent spaces. So if we have a map of surfaces, we say that it's conformal if at any point, if we have two tangent vectors and we look at the signed angle from the tangent vector x to the tangent vector y, and then we look at where those tangent vectors go under the map, then in that tangent space on the right-hand side, we should have the same angle, from, same signed angle 
from the tangent vector df of x to the tangent vector df of y. So we're not going to use that anymore, but that's, that's a more technical definition of what, what we mean by a map uh, preserving angles. So if a map preserves angles, it'll also preserve shapes, and it'll also take circles to circles instead of ellipses. So the Mercator map, one thing it does really well is preserves angles. The Mercator map is an example of a conformal map. And as a result, if we look at the images of lots of equally spaced and equally sized disks on the sphere, we'll get a bunch of disks that are actual circles. Of course, we have already seen that the sizes are not accurate. I mean, they, these are actually all representing the same size of area. And the fact that that changes reflects the fact that the Mercator skews area. But it does preserve shape. But I want to do one final map now, which is a much simpler map that also preserves shape. The Mercator map is a really complicated map, which we won't be able to, we wouldn't be able to explain the workings of in a short talk. But there's a much simpler map that also preserves shape. And that map is the stereographic projection. So the stereographic projection, it looks a little bit like the uh, mnemonic projection, but now we're mapping all of S2 minus the North Pole onto the entire plane R2. Uh, here's the formula for it, but I think it's easier to understand if we just look at this picture. So we imagine, imagine the sphere with the North Pole taken away. And the sphere is sitting on the origin, so its South Pole is on the origin. And to make this simple, we, we can, um, I guess in, this, in the way that I've written the formula, oh, I messed, okay, so I, there's a small mistake here. Um, I really want this to be centered at the point one half and be a sphere of radius 1 half. So, um, so I shouldn't have written unit sphere here. I should have said sphere of radius 1 half centered at 0, 0, 1 half. Because then uh, this formula will work out. But, but the picture hopefully will make sense. So imagine that we have a laser beam at the North Pole that's firing from the North Pole through the sphere and taking different points of the sphere to different points of the plane. So like the mnemonic projection, you can convince yourself that that's actually going to take all of the sphere minus the North Pole onto the entire plane. It'll never take two points to the same point, and it'll end up covering the whole plane. So, so that's the basic idea. In particular, it'll also take the equator to a slightly bigger circle here. And if we have a great, if we have a meridian, a great circle that goes through the North and South Pole, it'll end up taking that to a straight line. So those are a few of the, so those geodesics in particular do get taken to geodesics. So those are some features that one can notice immediately about it. Um, so a theorem that we will quickly go through a sketch of is that this stereographic projection map is in fact conformal. It preserves angles everywhere. So I'm not going to spend, the proof is not as easy. It's a little bit more complicated than the other proofs that we've looked at. Um, so if you can figure out these exercises, the proof will follow pretty easily. But these exercises will involve a little bit of computation using, involving this formula for the stereographic projection map. So you can try it on your own. And if you have questions, you could ask me later or tomorrow. Um, but but let's, let's talk about each of these exercises briefly. So the first fact is that any rotation of S2 can be thought of as the product of two reflections of S2 through great circles. So any rotation of the sphere, we can actually think of that as the product of two different reflections. So by a reflection through a great circle, what do I mean? I mean, you take a great circle on the sphere, and you literally imagine that that great circle, that the plane that creates that great circle is a mirror that reflects points. Um, no, that's okay. So that, yeah. If you so imagine that you have, um, maybe I'll draw a picture here. So imagine that you have a sphere. And let's take this great circle, this meridian great circle, from the North Pole to the South Pole. 
by reflection through that great circle, what I mean is that we take, um, well, if we, if we take this great circle to be the intersection of the YZ plane with the sphere, then by reflection through that great circle, I mean we send a point A, B, C on the sphere to the point negative A, B, C. So reflection through that great circle just reverses the sign of this coordinate if we take this great circle to be the YZ plane intersected with the sphere. So, so that's what I mean by reflection through that great circle. And you can imagine then what I mean by reflection through any other great circle. We're just taking a point, taking it, um, drawing a, um, a perpendicular from that point to the plane that creates that great circle and projecting through that to the opposite part of the sphere. So, so in fact, any rotation of S2 is the product of two reflections through two different great circles on S2. So th this, is a, this is a nice exercise to think about a little bit. And if you can figure this out, uh, then, then you're already some of the way, some ways towards proving that the stereographic projection map is conformal. The other two facts we need concern a different operation called inversion through a circle in R2. So inversion through a circle is just this map here, inversion through the unit circle. It's a, it sends a vector uv to uv over the magnitude of uv. Now, um, sorry? Uh, we should have a square in the denominator, you're saying? Yes, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes, yeah, so there's a missing square here. Yeah, so sorry, I should have written uv over, um, over u squared plus v squared. So, um, so if you can show that that preserves magnitudes of angles, then any um, inversion through any other circle, which we get by shifting that circle, by, by, um, by stretching that circle and shifting its center, um, that would also preserve magnitudes of angles. And the final part of this, the final exercise you would need to solve is that reflection through a great circle in, um, that if we, if we take the map that reflects through a great circle in S2, then this other map is inversion through some circle in R2, where this other map is taking the inverse stereographic projection map from R2 to the sphere, then applying reflection through a great circle, and then taking that back to R2. So in some sense, stereographic projection relates reflection in the sphere to inversion through circles in R2. So I think in the interest of time, I'll, I won't go through the details of the proof, but it follows very quickly from these three exercises. Um, because once we know that inversion through a circle is a conformal map, we can really reduce any, um, well, we can, we, okay, I, I'll say a little bit about this proof. So we can show that, um, so we can first show that the, the stereographic projection map near the South Pole is a conformal map. So any angle at the South Pole will be preserved under stereographic projection because any angle at the South Pole will be created by two great circles going through the South Pole. And those great circles would go to lines, and the angle between those lines would be exactly the same as the angle between the planes that created the great circles. So stereographic projection does preserve angles at the South Pole. And to show that it preserves angles at arbitrary points of the sphere, well, that's the hard part. So if we take an arbitrary point Q away from the South Pole, so any point Q that's not equal to the South Pole, we can let rotation of Q, through Q 
be the rotation of the sphere that takes Q to S. There's going to be a unique rotation that takes Q to S. Uh, that's another thing to think about a little bit if you haven't seen that before. Given two different points on the sphere, there's going to be a unique rotation that takes one to the other. And that rotation, by the exercise that you should think about if you're interested, can be expressed as a product of two reflections through two great circles. So this allows us to rewrite phi, the stereographic projection map, as, first of all, I'm just trivially rewriting it here. Rotation by through uh, that takes Q to S, followed by phi, followed by phi inverse, followed by the inverse rotation map, followed by phi. Everything cancels out, and that's just rewriting it in a kind of silly way. But we can then rewrite this left side in terms of these two other operations. And by the second and third exercises, each of these two maps is a conformal map. Oh, sorry, is, it, is an area preserving map. As a result, we have one, two, so obviously, um, oh, this should have been, Uh, so then, so now we have a product of maps which are area preserving because at, at Q. So rotation is always area preserving. Phi is taking Q to S, um, or sorry, rotation is taking Q to S and that's area preserving, uh, angle preserving. Phi is angle preserving at S. And then by the second two exercises, these two maps also preserve uh, angles. So all in all, we have a composition of different maps that preserve the magnitudes of angles, and therefore the composition also does. So, okay, so let, let's, uh, let's move on from these three particular maps. So we've seen a map that preserves area, and we've seen a map that preserves shape. Uh, is it possible to have a map that preserves both area and shape? Does anybody have a guess? So if we had a map that preserves area and shape, that would be great, because those are two properties that we really care about. And clearly, the Mercator doesn't do that. And so you might. So, so that might lead you to believe that we don't have a map that preserves area and shape, because if we did, we'd probably be using it. But does anyone have another reason why, or does anybody else have another idea about a map that might preserve area and shape, whether it could exist or any reason why it shouldn't be able to exist? Exactly. So a, 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 if, if a projection preserves both area and shape, it'll also have to preserve distance. So if you take a course in differential geometry later on, you'll be able to prove this theorem yourself, that if a map preserves area and is conformal, it'll also have to be distance preserving. And we know from Gauss's theorem that there is no distance preserving map of the sphere, from the sphere to the plane. So it's not possible. We can have one or the other, but we can't have both. Um, so, so in reality, we end up using things like the Mercator projection, which does some kind of compromise, and it does a good enough job of both in the, in the, in, for the purposes we care about and in the places we care about. So on the other hand, many people think that the Mercator projection doesn't really do a good enough job of both because it skews things so horribly near the top of the map and near the bottom of the map. And it so happens that a lot of those um, distortions actually work to the advantage of people who use this map because it makes Europe and the US look much more significant and it also makes other countries look less significant. So that's one of the criticisms of the Mercator that it actually used those, you know, it, it was actually quite happy to um, peddle those distortions. So are there maps that do a better job than the Mercator of compromising between shape and area. So there's some successful compromise maps 
that have taken a really interesting approach. Rather than projecting onto a cylinder or a plane, they've actually projected onto a polygon that's inscribed in the sphere, specifically a platonic solid. So maybe you've seen that there's five platonic solids that exist. And here are the maps we get by projecting onto inscribed platonic solids and then unfolding those platonic solids. Once you have a polyhedron like this, you can unfold it and get something flat. So this is a very interesting approach to creating a map. One problem with it is that you no longer have a rectangular map. But if you're OK with that, then this is actually a really good way to go. So one famous example is the Dymaxion map, which was made by Buckminster Fuller in 1943. So this projects the sphere, it's the same thing that we have over here, onto the surface of a regular icosahedron that's inscribed within the sphere. And unfortunately, it's a little faint, but you can see that um, you can see that we get a very interesting perspective on the continents because it becomes one contiguous landmass or nearly contiguous landmass. It also does a very good job of approximating both shape and area, which we can see from those same Tissot indices. Um, the other reason that Buck and Sturfuller, uh proposed this map is that it's free of a lot of cultural biases that are there in the Mercator and in other maps. There's no up or down, no north or south. And, and you also get this nice perspective on the continents that we don't get from a normal map. In fact, you could even argue that it's a more natural way of viewing the world since it agrees with the pattern of human migration out of Africa. Here's Africa here. And in recent years, in the last 10 years or so, DNA studies have reconstructed phylogenetic trees and shown the actual path that human beings took out of Africa to various parts of the world. And, and you can see how they traversed this single contiguous landmass that we see in the Dymaxion map of Buckminster Fuller. So another interesting compromise map is a more recent one that was actually inspired by the Dymaxion map. And this was done by the Japanese architect Hajime Narukawa, who invented something called the orthograph map. I mean, that's his name for it, in 1999. Now, instead of an icosahedron, the orthograph map projects the sphere onto an inscribed tetrahedron sitting inside the sphere. It uses a, if you just use a kind of um, simple projection, things are getting it very skewed. So it uses a very special and careful projection which is quite complicated to describe. But to keep, specifically, it's not the same everywhere. So it's very careful to keep the distortions minimal around continents and make sure that the big distortions happen in the middle of the ocean where we don't care about it as much. So you're thinking of the fact that they're, the tetrahedron and the cube are dual platonic solids, right? Or is that correct? Tetrahedron is self-dual. Yeah, the cube and the octahedron are dual. That's right, that's right. Um, not that I know of, because the pro I don't think so, because the projections are going to, well, it depends which projection you mean. But even if you look at a simple projection, the, yeah, the distortions are going to be different in the different objects. Even though they're dual, you're going to get different types of distortions. So um, so there's a big advantage to using a tetrahedron over an icosahedron, though, which is that the tetrahedron, when we unfold it, well, we get an equilateral triangle, right? But this equilateral triangle we get is a lot nicer than these other shapes because we can tile the plane with an equilateral triangle. So when you tile the plane, you can actually get an infinitely repeating centerless map. So in this picture, that tetrahedron, somebody actually made a rubber stamp of it and dipped it in ink, and you can literally go on rolling that around and get an infinitely repeating map of the Earth. So that infinite tiling 
is also called a tessellation. It's an example of a tessellation of the plane. And from this, you can actually construct many different maps. You would either take one of these equilateral triangles, like, um, let's see, starting here, go down to here, go over, go back up, and that's your map of the Earth. Or you could carve out various different rectangular maps of the Earth as well. So this picture shows some of the different maps you can carve out from this tessellation. So each of these maps, these rectangular maps, they're, when I say that they're, in each of these, every point is only of the sphere is only represented once. In the tessellation, each thing is represented infinitely many times. And if you take an arbitrary circle, like if I were to draw a circle here, I'm duplicating various points. So we don't want to take any old shape. But if we choose our regions carefully, we can actually get maps that represent each point of the sphere once and only once.